it's incredibly rainy and gloomy outside so i thought i might uh, set up my camera and like talk about the first five books that i've read this year i pretty much locked out in the fact that like all of these books are incredible if any Egyptian cannot speak english by Naga. in my previous video i actually talked about this novel ultimately it is a novel about like reading and misreading people and a lot about like identity politics sort of being the current like prison that we read people there's this way that we assign like privilege and culpability and responsibility um to people and in doing that you know we're also in a way trying to avoid our own like culpabilities i think in terms of in my last video i was talking about how some of like her commentary and like critiques on identity politics in the US and like cancel culture um, was sort of I just couldn't really grasp like what exactly she was trying to say and I think now thinking of it in this lens is sort of helping there's so much being done to like draw the reader into the story so that we are also having to second guess like our immediate assessments we're having to like reconsider the way that we like assign like blame and responsibility and like privilege and culpability and our ways of like reading privilege and oppression and so it's having us try to be more to, to try to do these things in a more like complex complicated contextualized way even honestly like a more generous way of like releasing with one another i'm thinking of like the third section and the discussion of this like um workshop like class has about the text it's honestly like a good way of of having me like reconsider the way that i would have like looked at certain things like like tiny ways where um we make excuses for some people's behaviors versus like other i don't know it's just like just in terms of thinking of culpability and responsibility and oppression and privilege and also how we're able to make sense of like harm and like who is creating harm who is um being harmed and thinking in those terms like i think the novel is asking us to try to be more like generous which i i i felt was like a necessary i don't know like a necessary thing to be forced to like reconsider great 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 I, I mean i've talked about this but like truly outstanding start to the year okay um i don't think i know how to talk about this book besides like gushing like i i genuinely don't know how to talk about this book negro land by marco jefferson truly one of my favorite books of all time definitely my favorite book that i've read this year just like what can i even say i don't know i don't know what i can say so negroland is basically part memoir part cultural criticism of margot jefferson's like childhood and like girlhood and also just like of this black bourgeoisie the black elite of like the 1950s and 1960s i saw a post someone made where they kind of talked about how they were um a bit they were questioning the premise because the idea of like black privilege does not exist and i do agree in the sense that like that is something that margaret jefferson is critiquing yes these people were privileged in the sense of them being educated them having like some proximity to not whiteness but like proximity through like mixed racial ancestry to like the benefits like colorism for instance i guess in a, a better way of putting it is like the ways that they were distanced from blackness be it through being educated being able to access certain privileges and certain like jobs and buy a house and there is a way that like that distancing from certain types of black people allowed them to enter into like certain spaces that meant that they were accessing a form of privilege but like it's a form of privilege that's like capped because ultimately like they're still black um especially in the 1950s and 1960s it's a conditional privilege that is dependent on them basically fulfilling certain obligations there's so much e effort involved in maintaining this like position that is not even it's this position that's like unstable it's brilliant i don't know. 
this was the one that I knew would be like really hard to talk about. My favorite parts of the memoir were like the cultural criticism and also not just cultural criti criticisms, but also like literary criticisms. She talks about like James Baldwin, Nella Larson. There's this really, really great section where she talks about being a child and reading um, Vachel Lindsay's, I'm probably not pronouncing his name right, but also I don't care because he was racist. <laughs> But he, he wrote this poem called The Congo. You can kind of imagine the sort of like ethnographic, sort of heart of darkness-y type um, racist descriptions and evocations. And what I was thinking of, one of my notes here is how this is like another instance of like all evidence pointing to her becoming a writer. And we also see how like perception emerge. We see like a point of view emerge um, her understanding of race expand become more complex ah oh, it's so good it's so so good like if you're going to read it for anything like you could also just like read it for the criticism i think there's a way that um works by like black particularly like autobiographical or memoir like personal works by like black writers are being held as like you know it's like how there were all those like essential reading list um during covid and during those like um, black lives matter like protest and the writer laura michelle jackson wrote a really compelling essay on how in trying to like combat racism with those like anti-racist reading lists they honestly ended up like flattening a lot of these works where you'd have like memoirs next to like academic texts next to like novels and it's like it doesn't allow for a full complex polymorphous like um scope of black life this to me is something that is so compelling because of how she has this singular perspective that she's writing from because of the privilege that she sort of holds there's a way that this perspective can be space taking but it's not because she is aware of it like she's writing from a point of view where she is able to like look back and like critique you know her upbringing some of their preoccupations and some of their desires and um and resentments and really like flesh it out really like address it and reckon with it and think about the wider like cultural impact of that i'm not doing this any um justice in describing this book but i just think everyone should read it here's another wonderful memoir that like also blew my mind. Where Did You Sleep Last Night? A Personal History by um, Danzi Senna. I think I'm pronouncing her name right. This um, made me very emotional, like reading it. So basically, Danzi Senna is, she sort of comes from like literary royalty. Part of why I was intrigued to like want to get this book was um, because I basically discovered that she's Fanny Howe's daughter. She's also married to Percival Everett, who's like a writer that I've heard people talk really highly about. Um, so there's this like writerly lineage. The synopsis or the premise basically is that she is trying to uncover like her history. We have this very established history of she's Fanny Howe's daughter, you know, like Fanny Howe is very well known, um, poet, writer, novelist, like thinker. What I learned through this is that Funny How also comes from a really privileged like Boston family with like reaches into um, slavery. Part of this book's preoccupations is with Dainty Senna, sort of like mixed race ancestry and again another sort of like commentary on American, American like race politics and race relations. It's the way that like a lot of um, like American like legacy and lineages have like a combination of like there would be enslaved people and also like slaveholders in that um, lineage which is you know it's not shocking what's that recent like program I don't know who's doing it but it's the one where um, it went viral on Twitter because Angela Davis like found out she had like slave owners in her lineage and there are people who sort of saw it as like a gotcha moment as if that was supposed to like undermine her politics but it's like no that is telling of the atrocities of slavery that is like a painful aspect of a lot of black people's existence right that's something that um is particular to american history and means that a lot of people have to like reckon with that funny house um 
Boston like family heritage like they have all of these recorded texts like Bunny Hall is literally not just her only like um writerly ancestor right as her mother there's many sort of like personal histories that have been written by people in her lineage she talks about like going through these texts like how sort of odd it was to go to libraries in boston to literally like be in boston and see streets named after like her mother's family and sort of in the same vein where like in negro land margot jefferson is sort of um situating herself within this legacy of like black chroniclers of like black bourgeoisie society and there's a way that like Daisy Sana is with the subtitle a personal history there's a way that she's also talking about the way like these histories have been written of her, her mother's family and she acknowledges that it is kind of like a privilege to have like a documented recorded account of your people and your people's history um, and how that's something that's not particularly afforded to like a lot of black people in America whose histories are like fraught or broken. The memoir is compelling for multiple reasons. One of the things I thought was really interesting was the way it's written. She's also compiled it like in mystery. There's many sections where she's like driving to meet this person who might be the clue to like this thing about her father's lineage and like there's also um She's also doing this with her father and like so she goes here and here's a photograph or here's a newspaper clipping. Again, another instance of something that could be a straightforward memoir that um, becomes more compelling in the how of the story. That's a way I think that like Daisy Senna's novelist like instincts are coming in, in in terms of like plotting the story. Her father's like lineage, there is the mysterious elusive Anna who is Daisy Senna's grandmother and Anna sort of like First of all, like the Anna's like husband or the father of her children, it's a mystery. Like everything about Anna is just like so mysterious. When you're introduced to her in the memoir, there's no immediate indication that like she's going to sort of loom over the story in this way where her actions or inactions um, carry so much weight in terms of deciding how someone might turn out. But yeah, it's also just about like the randomness of how we all just kind of like come to be and come to be really sad. It really is something about like chance and you know two people in the same place and obviously like larger interventions of history. The other like really really compelling part of this memoir is that in looking at these histories like Dame Susanna is also confronting her parents like relationship and marriage so Fanny Howe and her father Carl Senna were married for a little bit um, but the relationship was um, abusive and she writes about you know sort of being a child and witnessing some of those abuses and then learning about some of them later on in life um, and so in some ways this is also a memoir about like a father-daughter relationship where the father was like abusive and alcoholic um, a deadbeat in many ways um, and there's a real um, well, I, you know, felt very seen by this uh, memoir in terms of like the sort of complicated, multi-layered um, emotions and like feelings that you can have towards a parent. Um, thinking of the ways they might have disappointed or failed you, but also you're able to like acknowledge like their brilliance, even as you're thinking of the traumas that are inherited. Um, and there's a generosity too in the fact that she's trying to um, uncover his history there's a way that like she's also being generous in terms of wanting to discover like how he might have come to be the way he came to be whilst also you know acknowledging that like some things can't be helped i just i thought this was so 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 good like so good in multiple ways well written like just very this is another one that will stay with me for a really long time. Um, I can actually feel myself guessing a tiny bit like in which I'm talking about this. A really, really like wonderful memoir. Okay, here's something that I've always wanted to read. I've heard people talk about this um, and 
I'm so glad I finally got to read it because it is genuinely like a perfect novel. Like it's a perfectly crafted novel. The Transit of Venus by Shirley Hazard. It's funny, as I was reading this, like the first couple pages, I was like, okay, I'm so excited. Like I've heard so much about this novel. And then I started it and it almost felt like, not like a slog to read, but um, there were these long descriptions and these long ways of like, I'm like, okay, wait, what exactly is happening in this scene? And then I'm like 100 pages in and I'm like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this novel. But then I set it down and like immediately I'm like, I have to pick this up again. It, it feels like one of those like true novels. I'm rolling my eyes on myself, but like there's a way I kind of like conceive of those novels. Um, they feel very like weighty. It's how I felt when I read like On Beauty by Zadie Smith and Beloved by Toni Morrison where I was like, oh yes, this is like masterful. Like this is someone who has a mastery on like the craft of like a novel. In the sense of like scale and the sort of feeling that um, the characters don't like exist to be like mouthpieces for, you know, the um, author. Like the characters genuinely almost feel like they are living breathing people it feels like fate is like the true actor and that the things that are happening to these people you know the, the tiny little evidences of life which is that you meet people or like little accidents of of life and coincidence and synchronicity kismet all of those things they're powerful enough to determine like how we love death all of these things there's also so much on like human like fallacy there's this really great review by paro sagal in um the new york times where she reviews the book she says it's a novel about being wrong about the question which is like who are the weak who are the strong right um, and so many others about our gorgeous and distressing human confidence the way we march around plucky protagonists in our minds armed with horrifying partial knowledge of the motivations of those around us to say nothing of the forces we cannot see we like to think that we're bigger like plotters of what goes on in our lives but there's you know we're not privy to so much we're really a lot like smaller than um we think we are. What is the novel about though? Well, the two main protagonists of the novel really are like Caroline Bell and Ted Tice. But like Caroline and her sister Grace are two orphan sisters and they move from Australia to England. It basically kind of just follows their lives. Ted Tice is a, a young man who like meets them and again it's the same way like their lives are all kind of interconnected and the synopsis says what happens to these young women, seduction and abandonment, marriage and widowhood, love and betrayal becomes as moving and wonderful and yet as predestined as the transits of the planets themselves. Truly, truly masterful. Like, Shelley Hazard, like, really has a mastery on the craft of, like, storytelling characters. It's a wonderful, wonderful novel. The fifth book that I finished is my third Elizabeth Bowen read, because obviously I have to, like, sneak in a Bowen. The Death of the Heart by Elizabeth Bowen. This is a really good novel. There's a, like, blurb from The New Yorker that it's her best book. It's not my favorite Elizabeth Bowen novel, like, the House in Paris and um, the Hotel, to me, rate higher than this. But this is a really, really great novel too. Basically about this young girl, Portia, who is recently orphaned. In her father's will, he sort of says that he wants her to live at least for a year with um, her half-brother and his wife. It's sort of a story about um, this like naive, young, um, you know, innocent girl who she falls in love kind of um, she meets this guy named eddie who is essentially a cad <laughs> and um it's set you know in the 1930s and she meets him and she falls in love through that experience and not just the experience of like falling in love but the experience of like living with her um half brother and his wife and like sort of living in london and like um watching all of these different people she learns about herself and sort of learns about other people. In a similar vein to like The Transit of Venus, there's a way that this is a novel about like repetition and how 
meaning isn't really had until something like repeats it's one of those like really nice heels of like adolescent like coming of age in a sense funny enough like uh shelf and sensibility on bookstagram described it as well she, she kind of like quipped like um the Idiot by Elizabeth Bolton, you know, like a reference to Elif Bataman's like The Idiot. Okay, so those were the first five books that I read this year and yeah, it's been, it's been lovely.